And I'm, I'm Minky Warden. I'm a member of the Overseas Press Club Board. Other board members in the room, please identify yourselves by raising your hands or holding up your chopsticks. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Charles, Bob, and others. Um, Patty Krantz is the paramount leader, the executive <laughs> director of the Overseas Press Club. <laughs> So tonight is a, is a special night. It's a chance to uh, welcome old friends, to celebrate Chinese New Year, to force my small children to put on Chinese outfits <laughs> that they will hate me for in their teenage years. But they um, look so cute. <laughs> they do. Uh, uh, but we're also here to celebrate a wonderful new book, The Exquisitely Timed One Child. And um, Andy Jacobs could not be here tonight, so I'm going to be interviewing and subjecting my old friend May, May Fong to a little bit of uh, torture about her, about her book. And uh, then we'll open it for questions. This is also an event to celebrate the Overseas Press Club, a venerable 76-year-old organization. There's some wonderful pictures of John F. Kennedy doing Overseas Press Club events. And we have our annual dinner coming up in May where we honor April. the greatest journalism April. for the year April. Um, April. in international. April 28th. Oh, sorry, April, what? Not May. Oh, April, sorry. <laughs> April. April 28th. April 28th, almost May, <laughs> uh, where we'll, we will be honoring some of the greatest journalism for the year. And um, that's at the Mandarin Oriental. If you can join the Overseas Press Club tonight, please do. If you join, um, you will be taking home a door prize of May's wonderful book. Also, any working reporters who would like to write it up may also take a free copy. Um, so just to, to kick off, I would like to propose a toast to May because having a book is a little bit like having a baby. Some of us in the room know. And, um, and this book actually is about having babies. So tell us your story behind the book. Why did why write about the one child policy? It's been around since 1979. Why write about it in 2016? Well, or 2015, 2014. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to Minky and Gordon for hosting us in the Overseas Press Club. And also thank all of you for coming. I know there's a lot of exciting stuff at the New Hampshire primary, so competing for your attention tonight. So I really appreciate you coming out to listen to you know, me talk about my book. So um, Minky, you asked why now, why this book, why did, was I thinking about it? And um, well, from the start, I'll start by saying that um, I am a third generation Chinese. I was born in Malaysia. Uh, but uh, they say that overseas Chinese tend to be very much more traditional than uh, the Chinese in China, China because no cultural revolution to shape up things. So uh, one of the big traditions in my family was a love of sons. Uh, my father was uh, the 16 son, Shi Liu, 16 out of 18 sons. Uh, my grandfather had three wives. Um, uh, so um, men, my father married my mother and they had my first sister and my second sister, <laughs> and my third, and down to me, I'm the fifth girl. So um, one of the first things I knew about the one-child policy was from the very early start when uh, my relatives would tell me, you are lucky that you were not born in China because you would not be wanted. You might not even be born. I don't know how the circular logic of that works, but or you might be put away in a village well, or you might be given away or anything, but you are lucky. So that was my first introduction. So of course for a child's mind, this is a very sort of a Orwellian tone, even before I read Orwell, before I read, you know, it was obviously something, you know, like the uh, bogeyman in a way. And um, when I went to China in the mid 2000s, it seemed like uh, the one child policy had receded uh, in its importance. Um, China was an upswing. We were seeing Starbucks opening everywhere. Um, everybody was, celebrating uh, the event of the Olympics. It was Jia Yo Zhong Guo, and it just seemed like um, all these issues we had heard with abortions and sterilizations were, I think of a recent past, you know, and uh, maybe a necessary evil, perhaps, uh, in order for China to ascend. But um, I discovered um, that I, even, even, in a, even in the beginning, I was covering factories, mm -hmm. and um, I would go to, uh, factories in the south, I would go to Bra Town and a town that made toe clippers and a town that made entirely jeans. It was a lot of fun, but even then in 2003, 
uh, factory owners would tell me, look, we can't get enough workers. We're having a worker shortage. And this was 2003, and I said, how can you possibly have a worker shortage? You are China, you have the world's most populous nation. And so one of the theories floated around then was the one-child policy might be shortening that. But actually, a lot of economists kind of poo-pooed that one. They thought it's far too soon for China to see a decline in the population. But looking back then, that was actually the beginning of the end of China as a manufacturing juggernaut, uh, the, that the population was falling far faster than people predicted. And that was the start of my curiosity. I kept touching upon it in little, little ways. Uh, but the trigger was in 2008. Um, <laughs> that's a really cool ringtone. <laughs> um, in 2008, uh, the Olympics was the big show, right? Everybody was gearing up for it. It was going to be China's coming out party. But uh, something happened in the, uh, before the, uh, uh, the Olympic that sort of um, overturned that narrative a little bit, and that was the uh, Sichuan earthquake. Uh, when the earthquake happened, I was actually uh, trying to sneak into Burma. Um, there was another uh, disaster, at Cyclone Nargis, mm -hmm. and um, they had not been giving any visas out. Burma was still very closed up. I had a Malaysian passport. They thought maybe I could wangle an ASEAN connection and sneak in. Uh, it didn't work out that way. So, But when I was going back to Beijing, that's when the earthquake happened. So when I got back to Beijing, I thought, oh, I missed the story, because all my colleagues were already all the way to Chengdu. And I thought, oh, I missed the story. But I realized that um, a lot of um, people from Sichuan work all over China. They're sort of like the internal migrants of China. So I thought, OK, what I'll do is I'll follow a group of migrant workers back home. Uh, this is like a distance between um, New York and Chicago, say. But for migrant workers, it's much harder. You can't afford plane flights, so they take trains. So I said, I'll go follow them. So I followed a group of migrant workers back. We took about three days. We took trains, boats, motorbikes, walk, bus. And when we got home, it was not a good story for them. A lot of them discovered that a lot of loved ones were killed. And then also discovered that a lot of the children were killed because a lot of school, uh, schools uh, collapsed. So what does that have to do with the one-child policy, you might ask? I mean, wasn't it just a natural disaster? The thing was, I discovered later on, this this area was a was near the uh, the epicenter was was a test pilot project for the one child policy before they took it nationwide. So, um, so they they practiced on this area, and so the consequently thirty something years later, a lot of the children killed were single children, yeah, yeah, only yeah. children. So um, one of the first stories I did was a, a lot of parents who were rushing back to the hospitals to get reverse vasectomies, mm -hmm. reverse sterilizations, mm -hmm. because they had, you know, that's part of the parcel of the project of getting a one child. After you've done your birth quarter, you are required to get sterilized. So of course, 30 years later, all these people were trying to reverse the procedures. They were so desperate. Uh, there was a man I met who was a faucet farmer, and he said um, he lived in a very, very poor village in one of the poorest parts of Sichuan, and he said he, he was 50, his wife was 45. They said, without children, um, our, our neighbors are starting to avoid us. They're shunning us because without children, we have no status. Uh, they think that we're going to be useless hanger-ons, um, you know, and borrowing money from them and borrowing things from them all the time. We just cannot live this way. We can't. So, so that was the beginning of, of the, the 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 thing for me. Yeah. You know, the, for me, the most, uh, you know, uh, May and I came into contact first um, through her reporting. She did a wonderful story where she followed a migrant worker who was building the, you know, the Olympic stadiums and infrastructure who was cheated out of his wages and shared a Pulitzer for that reporting. Um, but that story of the earthquake was the really the untold story because it was buried, as you say, by the Chinese government who didn't want anything to spoil the party. Uh, the, the story where you followed the family home um, only to find out that their daughter was killed in one of the tofu buildings. I think it's, is, you know, as a parent, it's a, it's a tragic thing. And uh, we actually uh, had an au pair and her twin sister who were from Chengdu. And uh, you know the, the earthquake felt very real for us. They had family members and others who, who were affected by that. And also, since she was a twin, I've always been aware of how wonderful that bond was, and yet so many uh, Chinese families don't have 
were not ever given the option to have another child. I, you know, you explained that it was an elastic policy by the time you were reporting there. But, um, you know, for me, the book felt very real. I know I have friends from Chengdu. We've been there with our children. And, you know, the, the city has transformed, actually, from when I first went in 97. And it is a building boom. And talk to us a little bit about the, um, you know, some of the some of the stories that you learned for the book and your own experience um, in the in the course of, of writing and reporting. Yeah, I mean, very quickly. I mean, I think a lot of people now are aware since China made the announcement uh, t that they were shifting to a two-child policy late last year. So a lot of the uh, outer parameters of the reasons why they're doing so, why China might be headed for a demographic disaster, are kind of laid out very clearly now. So the problem is now they're too old, uh, too male, and too few. So this was kind of how I tried to re report it by the stories. I didn't want this to be a UN report. I wanted it to be stories about people. So I tried to explore some of these options. So what does it mean when uh, it's too male, for example? So. One of the things I did was to visit some of these bachelor villages. Um, I went to this village where they had no marriageable women at all. Uh, and, and so uh, what happened in that village was the bride price shot up. So that's a kind of reverse dowry. Mm -hmm. so, um, so because of the shortage issue, you know, um, it, got, it used to be just clothes, exchange of furniture maybe. Then it shot up to 10 years worth of farming income. So what happened was they started having scams. Uh, what I what it led me to this village was I read a story about runaway brides in central China, and you know my imagination was seized. I thought <laughs> all these women leaping across the paddy fields in their wedding gowns with the veils streaming behind them, and um, and then I thought, what is a bachelor village like? Is it full of you know lonely, lurking, horny men? And you know, was I going to be safe? Uh, blow up, blow up uh, brides. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I remember asking our our, research, our only male researcher in the office. I said, Kelsen, Kelsen, you got to come with me. I think you know it would be a bit safer. But I discovered that a. Uh, 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 you were worried <laughs> you were going to be a bride. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have been passed and not even worth a chicken. You know, but. Um, <laughs> But the idea was, I discovered a bachelor village in China is pretty much like any other village in China, which is to say it's full of old people and children. Um, the men are registered on the books as residents, but nobody can make a living on the village. They all have to go and work in the, in the cities. But their MO is to get married so they can dump the wife back home and take care of the children and the, the mother in laws. And, and you could see life in a village is very hard. Um, the plots are small. You still do a lot of the farm work by hand. There's no very little mechanization very little running water. They only had like one small uh, sort of shop in the village uh, mm -hmm. by which they, they uh, sell mostly fertilizer and, and fer uh, pesticide. And pesticide is exactly what they used to kill themselves with, the women mm -hmm. in the village. Uh, China for a long time used to have a much higher rate of suicide among women than uh, men, which is very unusual among the rest of the world because the rest of the world, most, mostly it's men who kill themselves in greater numbers. You are violent people. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, but now because you know women have more opportunities in the factories, they also have no inheritance rights mostly in the villages. So there's no uh, reason for them to linger. So they are going. And so, but of course, you know, you think, oh, good for women. But then it's not so good for men because uh, they're all s left in this. So they're called uh, bare branches, you know, biological dead ends. And there are about 30 million of them. That's about the size of Canada. Um, so unless China imports a canadian size uh, population of women, um, you know, this is the situation that's going to make. But it also translates itself not just in rural China, but also in, um, in modern China. You know, just dating. I went mass dating exercises. I, I went to uh, one of those ones where they make you do all these exercises, like massage each other and <laughs> introduce each other. And I wrote about it in a book. Um, because, you know, the idea is that um, it's not just sterilizations and abortions and these kind of dramatic things that the one-child policy has affected, but just simple, ordinary decisions like marriage and dating. Obviously, if you are an only child and you are also a male, your parents are very invested in what you do. So um, they're very interested in who you marry. And China is one of the few places where parents will advertise and put classified ads for ch their children in, in, in parks, you know, it's like the, the, the pre-Tinder Tinder, you know, you know where you can swipe left, swipe right, you know, how, how uh, my child, you know, 40 years old daughter, uh, she's looking for a man, you know, uh, 35, you know, all this you see in the parks. 
So that was the, you know, so it obviously affects dating dynamics. It also affects uh, how you die. Because here's the thing, um, China is aging rapidly. They have, um, and very soon they're gonna have a European sized population of retirees. Um, that's what. Um, size of Europe, guys. That's <laughs> yeah. what, not, <laughs> no Europeans, size of Europe. Size of Europe, <laughs> which is to say, um, basically if all the senior China were to form their own country, they would be the world's third largest country. China, India, senior China. That would be the three most populous nations. So that, has nothing to do with the one-child policy. It's simply a factor of us living longer. We all are. Uh, technology's helping us. But the, fa the sad part is there's going to be a much smaller working size populations to support that. That's the big tragedy. Um, and you know how this is translated out into a dozen personal tragedies. You know, we all know what it's like to take care of elderly parents and all that. Imagine that magnified a thousand fold. China already has 25% of the world's Alzheimer's sufferers. You jump forward in 20 years, it's going to be over 60%. And, and that's all the same for all the parametrics. So I spent time in a hospice in Kunming, um, you know, figuring out what it's like. And it, it, it's a very bleak and dismal. That was actually the hardest part to mm -hmm. report because this hasn't quite happened yet. This, this is going to happen very soon. And, and by the time your book was published, the people in hospice were no longer with us. No. Um, most it, of them. You know, we are the overseas press club, um, and one of the topics that is of great concern to us is, of course, uh, freedom to report in China. Um, I met you in the context of the Beijing Olympics. Um, is there a, you know, talk to us about you, and you've left China, you're no longer reporting there, but like everyone who follows it closely, press freedom remains a concern. I think, in a way, you wouldn't have thought of it at the time, but that was one of the golden eras of reporting. It was the pre-Olympic period when China had promised that reporters would no longer have minders, and you were reporting on a social phenomenon which is less, um, wasn't, wasn't as likely to trigger any, um, any concerns. Mm -hmm. talk, talk to us about China today since you've left, and you know, so how has your book been received? So, you know, we were always told before you go to China, there are what the, the, the forbidden topics, right? Uh, the treaties, Taiwan, um, Tiananmen, um, what was the other one, Tibet? Tibet. Tibet. And then the other one is treaties and an F, Fang Gong. Yeah. 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 So that was the three things, the untouchables. Uh, other than that, you were kind of okay, maybe, most of the time. But now I think um, the general case is the reporting in China is, uh, what can you report? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of things now, the space, I think it's not so bad so much for foreign reporters, you know, we, we are safe, you know, like people ask me, for mm -hmm. example, was I ever persecuted? I had, well, I was safe, I have a Chinese face, but I had a foreign passport, so that helped me a lot. Um, I was able to blend in with the local population on occasion, but I was also able to get out on occasion, and this was not the same for a lot of people. There was a uh, Chen Zorin, uh, one of the men mm -hmm. who tried to uh, find out more about the tofu school situation, he was an activist, he was sentenced to five years in labor camp. So um, the situation is much, much smaller. It's not even just reporting per se, but books. So three years ago, um, I had an offer from CITIC, which is a major state-owned publishing company, to for the Chinese rights to the book. But they said, uh, we want... Um, the rights to maybe change anything sensitive, which is very standard for, right. and I said, I haven't written a book, I don't know what you think is sensitive, it might be the whole book, let's table the offer and we'll talk when I'm done. Well, nobody's talking now, <laughs> because in the three years since then, um, you know, the, the space has tightened up a lot. And um, I'm very anxious for the book to be published in Chinese, because I want Chinese people to read it, because this is about them. And um, I'll, I'll, I wanna read you a quick note I got from a Hong Kong publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote to her and uh, said, hey, you know, would you be interested in my Chinese rights, uh, with the Chinese rights? And she said, basically, this is what, I, I, I really want to read this to you because it's... And while, while you're looking that up, I will say that as many people in the room know, five publishers have vanished in Hong Kong and Thailand and southern China. Um, they've been abducted. It's now known by the Chinese government, extra legal abductions. And this is obviously um, a topic of concern for the Overseas Press Club, but also anyone who is writing or publishing because it means that no one is really safe, whereas we always thought Hong Kong or 
maybe Thailand was safe if you were. Yeah, right. I mean, they're publishing bodice rippers. You know, who takes these things seriously? But uh, eventually, the Chinese government. Well, While you look that up, I will point out that I have it, it here now. Oh, okay, it's it's also the Chinese government's own fault for censorship. There wouldn't be such an appetite for bodice rippers about Politburo <clears throat> members if they were if there was freedom of the press. Yeah. So <laughs> forbidden food always trades sweet. Now this is a respectable publisher. They published some very good memoirs in the pub, uh, in the past, and they and she and this person wrote to me and said, I'm sorry to say that Hong Kong is suffering from an increasingly hostile publishing environment, as you might have heard. It is not the sensitivity of your book that is the problem, but the distribution. Almost all Hong Kong bookstores are banning sales of the books that we publish. Not only the traditionally left-wing chains that make up 70 to 80% of the bookstores, but even Page One and s -Lite, which are Singaporean and Taiwanese in their Hong Kong branches. That leaves a handful of independent bookstores and a couple of important ones, including the Causeway Bay Bookstore, closed down in the past month. Without good local distribution as our base, we face an uncertain future. So uh, on that somber note, and I mean, I, you know, but, I, and, I, and I do, I, I bring greetings from Nick Kristoff and a lot of people who are great fans of your book. And I will, I recommend it, even if you do not leave here tonight with a copy of the book, I recommend reading it. It's got it's got wonderful reporting, not just on the one child policy, but on the Huco system, on a lot of uh, things that you know. It's a it's a wonderful portrait of China today in many respects, and a window on China today. Why don't we open it for questions? We've got quite a few um, former China correspondents or Hong Kong correspondents or actual Chinese people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Any any questions from the audience? Uh, okay. Charles. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you if you had detected any change in the attitude of the preference for a son, which led to all these sonogram abortions. I mean, when I was last in China, it seemed to me that there's this at least among the middle class, the women are actually quite affluent and you know could potentially support parents and grandparents. I mean, has there been any change at all in this attitude? That uh, okay, I'll tell you a story and a, and a statistic as well, which will sort of, yeah. It has changed, um, you know, like for the example, this uh, bachelor <coughs> village I spoke to. So all these men had been very bereft. Um, their wives had run away with the dowry. And because every family had to borrow a lot of money to get their sons married off, uh, they were sort of in a financial limbo. And there was a, a parent I talked to who had another son waiting in the wings, and he said, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I borrowed all this money so my first son could get married, now I have a second son. I wish I had daughters. <laughs> so the financial incentive is there. China at one point, I mean, so the average rate for boys to girls, it's about 105 boys born for every 100 girls. That's nature's way of compensating for uh, risky violent stuff that boys do uh, to equal COVID. <laughs> in, um, and the mother of two sons. <laughs> in China, which is the highest uh, gender sons. ratio in the world, it's, I think it's about 117 boys to 100 men. I mean, India is about 110. To, and in some provinces, it's something as high as 130 boys to 100 uh, girls. But that uh, appears to have peaked. So that, you know, people are saying that that's good news, that people are recognizing that, um, you know, having a girl is certainly as good as a boy. Certainly, urbanization is a big factor. For the first time ever in history, the balance is uh, more for urbanization than um, rural. It used to be, you know, 80% of all Chinese people live in farms, so they clearly value boys because of the physical label. Now, you know, a factory girl or a white-collar person is, is, you know, just as good as a boy as a girl. So. So it is changing uh, for the better. I, I, w I will say I, I interviewed in northern Thailand women, um, uh, Kachin women, who had been trafficked to China. They, it was advertised that they would go as um, domestic workers, but in fact they were being trafficked to be brides. And um, a few of them escaped and I interviewed them. Um, you know, is this going to have an effect beyond China's borders? Uh, what it, what oh. is the effect? Well, definitely. I mean, you might argue that China's uh, one-child policy has benefited a certain subsection of Chinese women. That is to say, urban women born after 1980, no siblings mm -hmm. to share with, you get a better chance of going to college and all that. But for certainly for her sisters, the border sisters, Cambodia, Vietnam, North Korea, it's not been good. Trafficking is on the rise. There's a shortage of women going on. It, it's only going to go higher, so it's, it's not, you can't overall argue that it's been good for women. You really can't. 
take a couple more questions. Uh, Jeff and um, so this is actually something that's, that's happened around the world, the collapsing demographic uh, reproduction mm -hmm. rights. And, and I, I'm curious if you have a crystal ball into the future now that the, now that the, uh, the, the one-child policy has been eased, do you think that people are going to, you're going to see a surge of reproduction or is it going to kind of be a, a, a chain reaction where, you know, there's only one child and that person only has one child and you get a halving of each generation? Well, I think it's highly unlikely. The thing about China is a lot of the things we see in China happen elsewhere too, but the one-child policy has sort of sharpened these tendencies, if you will. So uh, uh, preference for sons happens elsewhere too, but the one-child policy you know, sort of accentuated that. Uh, an aging society, yes, happens elsewhere. We have it in Europe too, and to some extent in America, although immigration helps that out. Uh, but China has done it in 25 years. What? It's taken 50 years for Europe to do. So everything with the one-child policy has brought at a half it's sharper, faster, it's like a tsunami. So, so um, insofar as the idea of um, unleashing the baby gates, I, I seriously don't see it happening. Certainly a lot of polls indicate that um, you know, a lot of people don't want the second child. They're citing high, and you know, it's expensive, it's hazardous, it's polluted. You know, the iron, bo the rice bowl is broken. Yeah. There's no free education, There's no free, no free, so free health care. Yeah, so unless China comes forth with a huge package of things to incentivize that, um, you know, the way say France has, um, you know, free education, free schools, maternity benefits. It's hard to see the reversal. And let's not forget, at the same time, China has a lot of things to spend on, including the aging population issue. So it's going to be a question of what they're going to juggle. They certainly have a lot of demands on their demographic purse. You know. So we're going to take two, a couple more questions, and we'll take uh, both questions at the same time. So first. OK, so I think you probably read a story from Taishin Media a couple of years ago. Because of the child, uh, one child policy, the girls dumping into the orphanage were actually sold to the third parties, and some of them were sh sold and then shifted to the rest of the world, mostly to uh, to US or to European countries. Uh, what I view from out of in China, living out of China, is the real China you see over there, and the China were reported over, was reported over there, and the China was painted here. It's always quite different. Do you see the information gap between the real China versus the China were reported here in the West West? The world, the gap is narrowing or it's getting bigger, and how it's going to be in the next maybe five to ten years. So, wait, one one question on the information gap and Milan. Um, I hear that without the influence of, of women, um, men kind of go wild very quickly. <laughs> I, don't know how, I, I don't know whether it's true or how scientifically based it is, but it seems kind of logical. I just wonder whether you see any evidence, like in the village of uh, bachelors, whether... So, yeah. so one question about the information gap, the second, Lord of the Flies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you brought up the issue, issue of adoption, and uh, who here does not know someone who has adopted a child from China? I'm sure you, you all know somebody who has. Um, I don't call it, consider it more of an information gap, but more, to me, it was more like economic issues. So there are about 120,000 children um, some of them not children anymore, who were adopted out of China as a result of the one-child policy, most of them girls, and about 70% of them are here in America. So this is an interesting story that's still developing, and I write about this from different angles. I've interviewed both the farmers who've had their children seized from them and stolen and put into orphanages. I've interviewed adoptive parents who've adopted children from China. I've also interviewed some of these adoptive children themselves, some of them who are only in their early 20s now, and sort of questioning. And the thing that always kind of troubles me was, um, I met this far guy who was a farmer, and uh, that's exactly what happened to him. He had his child stolen from him. And, I, I, and he believes that this child, um, through the aid of a US-based organization, is, is living in Chicago. Uh, but the adoptive parents refused to submit the child's DNA for a proof of testing to, to, to determine whether or not you know, there really is. So I said, you know, what happens if you could prove this is your child? And he says, I want her back. And I said, but you know, she spent 10, 15, you know, 12 years living somewhere else. She doesn't speak your language. And you know, this is a, the, the ignoble part of me. I was sitting there with him, and he was you know, spitting out flecks of tobacco on the floor. You know, he, his accent was very thick. And I was just trying to imagine this with some kid with a Barbie doll in the you know, suburb. You know, and I was like, you know, I just don't see this having a happy conclusion. He said, OK, I, okay, I don't want her back then, but I would like her to come and see me sometime. And I want her to know that I never meant to give her up. And then I also talked to a woman who was a Midwest executive who had um, 
adopted two daughters from China. I said, hey, you, you are savvy, you know the news, you know that some of these kids were trafficked. How do you reconcile this with your own story? You adopted your two daughters. Do you think, how do you deal with it? And she said, well, I thought about it at Christmas a couple of years ago. My daughter was hanging the Christmas lights up. And I thought, well, at least she's hanging the Christmas lights. She's not making the Christmas lights. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I was like, I get your point too. But, but, you know, ultimately we have to draw a line somewhere. Yes, a lot of these children are materially better off. There's no question there. But are we saying it's okay then to steal people's children? You know, what is, where do we draw the line there? You know? So, so that's my question on that. I hope, I mean, that, yeah. And then Lord of the Flies, yes. Um, so China, um, there are a lot of theories about what this means, a more male China, a more virile China. Is it gonna be a more uh, a muscular China? Certainly there are some sociologists who argue that uh, this, uh, the China we see now, which is much more militant, especially if you see in the South China Sea or the East China Sea, <laughs> may possibly be a reflection of uh, their demographic mix. I think it's a hard line to draw because there are many reasons why, uh, you know, China's ascending, so there are many reasons why I think it's taking a more uh, strident role in its, uh, its place in the world. However, uh, a very clear line can be drawn between the imbalance in sexes and crime rates. So certainly the parts of China where they have much higher male than female ratio are also direct correlation with higher crime rates. Know exactly what shape or form uh, a, a gender imbalance China is going to take, but every place that has more men than women, severe imbalances, are not happy places. <laughs> Arab Spring, you know, prison systems. <laughs> I mean, I, I challenge anybody to think of a, a good imbalance. Okay, maybe the Amazon, you know. The Vatican. Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, they are so happy that they, oh, never mind, oh, no, it's, in. No. <laughs> it's off topic. Um, so I'm going to take a last round of questions, and then anyone who has other ones can also um, stop me from eating the dumplings to, to ask them. So we'll go to Sharon, we'll do, we'll do everyone who wants one. Yes, Sharon? Great, well, thank you so much for your wonderful recording and really insightful, terrific stories. Um, I was curious that the China of the future, now that one child, so-called loosening, which was never one child, but um, designer babies or a designed future. You know, this whole trend, what do you see? Were you seeing seeds of that earlier where people who had the resources, you know, could not only choose male or female, but could choose the genetic makeup of that child and you know, the, the genes. So I'm really curious well, about I, what you I, saw I, of that. I earlier. write about this in the book because one of the things I did um, was IVF. I did IVF in Beijing uh, at a private clinic. Um, and one of the things I discovered very early on were people using technology to get around the one child policy. So people who weren't specifically infertile, but they wanted triplets or twins mm -hmm. as, a, as a, because it counts as a single live birth. So you don't, you don't have to pay the fines, you're not liable to lose your job in the way you would. So that was kind of you know, the, the first inkling. And then there were also cases of people uh, having fake twins, <laughs> uh, which is to oh, say yeah. they registered <laughs> two siblings born very close apart. You know, the Chinese are very, very ingenious, so you know, you know somewhere to get around it. Uh, but, but one of the other parts I discovered, uh, write about in the book is now, you know, the baby flow is kind of reverse, you know? Y in the 90s, uh, people from America were going to China to get babies. Now, Chinese are coming to America to get babies. Um, a much smaller section, but these are specifically people who come here either to uh, give birth and get the American passport, or in search of third-party reproductive technologies they cannot do back in China, partly because of the one-child policy. So because of the one-child policy, which regulates that a lot of these treatments are only available to married couples, so, um, uh, so surrogate mothers uh, are, are a great area. Uh, there have been cases in China where surrogate mothers were taken away for forced abortions. So because of all this, you know, people come here, uh, a lot of it, because um, the, the, the technology is advanced, the law certainly in places like California protect the birth parents more. So we have a very small subsector of very wealthy Chinese parents. And one, I talk about some of them in a the book. I, I profile this guy called Tony Jiang, who has two children born with uh, a, a surrogate uh, mother from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And I talk about all that, and he spent something like two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and he paid cash for most of it too. Um, and now he, uh, and so I, I, I talk to all these, uh, and what it does is it's shaped uh, the dynamics of a very evolving industry too. Um, um, the, because of the Chinese influence, uh, the demand for Asian egg donors 
here in America has shot up to triple. Um, and, and they also have very specific demands because this is a rich clientele. They want um, usually uh, higher than five foot five. Uh, they want a high <laughs> IQ. Uh, they sometimes want a double eyelid and they also want to see pictures of you as a child with a double eyelid to make sure you didn't do it surgically. <laughs> um, and because they're not enough Asian egg donors to satisfy demand, now they're flying uh, <laughs> uh, uh, women from Taiwan and China over here to donate the eggs to make the baby that's born here, then it's brought back to China subsequently at some point. And you just, your mind just boggles. Now, let me just be fair here. Chinese are not the only ones doing designer babies. As and when the technology goes, people will do it. But there is a gene sequencing lab in Shenzhen, the biggest one in the world, BGI, which is trying to isolate the gene uh, for intelligence. Now, scientifically, maybe that's not possible, but they certainly are trying. And they are, their argument is we, we can try and, uh, we, our aim is to try and boost uh, the IQ of the baby in vitro by 20 points. <laughs> yeah. um, now, maybe they won't succeed, but the point is there's a lot of reception, receptivity to the idea in China. And my, my argument is the one-child policy has predisposed. I mean, if all these things, if and when they become available, I, I think the Chinese will be at the forefront and demands for this technology because the one-child policy already predisposed them to choose many things in the, in the business of, of having children. You already have to choose how many children you have. You already have to choose, you want a boy or a girl. Uh, in some ways, biology, you're already pre-selecting for certain things, like your egg donors, you want choosing smart, you're choosing this. The more the menu expands, the more likely uh, they will make a significant impact as, as consumers. Okay, I'm gonna collect a last round of questions because I know we have a lot. Here and then Alvin, yes. Yes, um, I was actually born in Taiwan, so I went to see the Olympics. I stayed for two years and worked there. Really want to see how China changed over time. And um, so my students, they really have a lot of resentment because the one-child policy poverty was enforced. Not evenly, people who were rich could get away with things, so with corruption and everything involved. So with this uh, change, do you see like the oopsie moment, the, the power that Mm, uh, do they have to pay a price or it, it's not going to be helpful when they try to stay in power with the economy going down and a lot of things changing not going their way so do you see like political the, the situation that that so the the divide mm -hmm. between rich and poor one alvin um, I want to pick up on your last answer, which touches on how policy decisions in China ripple out and have consequences in the rest of the world. So how, are, how is the relaxation of one-child policy and things like going after naked officials you know, who stash their assets or families abroad, how is that going to affect the rest of the world? Okay, so we're gonna I'm going to collect them and I'll keep track. So the poverty divide, naked officials. Yes. Um, did you write anything in your book about the effect of one-child policy on grandmothers? Because I've been having some very interesting experiences supervising psychotherapy in China and how it strikes me there's going, they're in a lot of trouble in the next generation because the daughters that have MBAs and engineering degrees are pushed back to work while the grandmothers take over the babies because they've only been allowed to have one. And there's something I see again and again. And so I'm seeing a lot of babies who end up with grandmothers and not mothers. So I wonder about that. Anyway, I don't know if you found that and if it's in your book. The mother-in-law problem, yes. Mother-in-law. <laughs> um, any, anyone else? OK, so I'm going to actually have you start with the mother-in-law problem, mm -hmm. go to the naked officials mm -hmm. problem, which is greater, a greater China question, and then deal with the gap between rich and poor, which you write about so eloquently. Okay, I love the fact how uh, writing about one-child policy allows me to extrapolate across all of China. I know. <laughs> okay, I will try. We and know you've reported on other things. Too, I know. So. I'll try and um, answer to my best of my ability. In terms of the mother-in-law question, I do write a little bit about also the mother and, and the mother. I do write a little. Yes, I do write a little bit about the, the pressures it's faced by um, the so-called little emperor generation because of all these uh, general pre generational pressures placed upon them by the older um, 
you know, their grandparents and your parents. Uh, I don't write about something as specific as the mother-daughter bond. I don't. But I did just an inter there's an interesting story I, I read about it just last week where they talk about the rise of child brides in an area in Yunnan. It was a beautiful photo essay about China Fao where they talk about how basically because um, so many of the um, young people leave and go and work in the factories, the parents are encouraging these children to get married as young as 13 and 14, produce a child, a grandchild for them to take care of, and then they go off to the factories. And this is a stunning photo of a grandmother breastfeeding her grandchild while her teenage daughter looks on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's mind boggling, mm -hmm. right? So you can sort of see, um, certainly there's a lot of theories that argue that, um, and James Liang, who is a CEO of C-Trip, which is kind of like China's Expedia, he's written mm -hmm. a book called Too Many People in China, question mark. His big thesis is that uh, because of this seniority issue in China, um, it's, it's gonna be very uh, a big dampener on the entrepreneurship and all because there's too many old people at the higher level so that you know nothing developed so uh, uh, yeah um, next book <laughs> that that and the censoring of information um so let's actually go to alvin's question about sort of the macro uh, oh. question of officials and and i say this as someone whose husband's <coughs> feng shui master came to america to have a baby so therefore could assess the feng shui and it's flat <laughs> <laughs> um, certainly, I mean, the, the issue of, uh, of children and the rich and poor and this type of, and, and, the, and the corruption issues, uh, I, I actually wanted to do, I thought as a fun joke thing to do would be to do a whole list of uh, officials who had more than one child and, and sort of list them out, but I, I wasn't able to completely verify in that. A, so in a <laughs> chart, like yeah, Bloomberg chart. or the Times. Yeah, you know, and it's sort of like the higher they go up and then, you know, uh, the flow chart. Uh, but I wasn't able, to, but I did notice that, you know, for example, Financial Times just did a story about the uh, three or four richest men in China and they did a sort of a little quick bio stats of each of them. <coughs> and each and every one of them had more than one child. Um, so uh, the, the issue of how one child touches on this whole naked official I think I particularly see it with the issue of concubinage because um, you know women are now a scarce commodity so to speak in China and so uh, <laughs> if you talk about it in those terms then uh, when you see uh, the officials and one of the ways we see a sort of exposure of this is now all these uh, uh, women mistresses who sort of write and expose their Lovers, <laughs> not so much anymore now that New Century Press is shut down. Yeah. No, yeah, but for a while it was really, you know, fun and gripping reading. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't completely understood. I have to think about it, but I, I promise to. Um, yeah, your what was your question again about? Um, also, oh, yeah. the rich and poor divide. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. The political shake up, like this is a, and the party went out minute. Whoopsie, we got the party wrong. Let's make some changes. A little bit too late, maybe, but we we're gonna change it. Um, and how did that really come about? Like who pushed with behind? And um, and is it gonna shake up like the power? I've been told. Uh, I can't say that I have any great deep knowledge of this. That Xi Jinping was actually quite instrumental in wanting to end the one-child policy. Uh, I mean, it's not his bad. He didn't institute it. Uh, so um, you might say it's to his credit that of all the things he's done, it's, it's been one of the more decisive things in the last three years. Um, you know, the, they argue that he did it more than Li Keqiang, uh, because, you know, Li Keqiang was, uh, you know, party secretary in Hunan, where there was much more transgressions, more people had double children. Um, and uh, Xi Jinping was a party secretary in Zhejiang, which is, you know, the Shanghai era, where there's a lot, a huge declining birth rate. So he was much more aware of the problem very early on. Um, now, um, you know, sometimes it's all reading tea leaves to figure out what the leaders in Zhongnanhai are thinking. But it's to their credit that they want to end it now, but certainly at the same time, there will be no postmortem of this, you know, as there has been no postmortem of 1989 or the Cultural Revolution or anything, you know. They'd like to sweep it away. And, and one of the things I'd like to say, because I, my day job is at Human Rights Watch, um, I would like to point out that the one-child policy has become a two-child policy, which means that the Chinese government and the worst and most corrupt officials are still dictating to women what they can do with their reproductive system. So the, the whole system is still fundamentally corrupt. A lot of the abuses that you document are still, you know, although it's the one child policy becomes a two child policy, 
a lot everything that you've presented as a problem is still ongoing and well, yeah. I mean just last week they announced that they're going to offer free operations to women to reverse their sterilization process and to remove their IUDs uh, so they can have these more children that China wants and I'm thinking to myself what's the next step what you are <laughs> forced to remove your IUD yeah I mean you know well first no children and then now you want children I mean that women are like taps you know turn on turn off <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's fundamentally very uh, unsettling for a woman to be told. I mean, you know, it's just a question of a degree of years. You know, two, two years ago, uh, a woman, a peasant woman was uh, forcibly, uh, had a seven month fetus forcibly aborted. Two, three years now, the line they would welcome that one and say, hey, have it, no, more. <laughs> Which goes to our point about the Politburo not being, um, you know, the, there are no women. <laughs> they, yeah, there are no women uh, on the Politburo, and they probably shouldn't be making these decisions. So um, th thank you all. Uh, we have plenty of uh, yeah, special thank you for me. And uh, we, have, we have plenty of drinks. And anyone who didn't get to ask a question, please ask it. Any new OPC members? should ask me to sign a book that you get as your welcome and thank you gift for joining the Overseas Press Club. And, um, and I, I would like to just also say we have many wonderful book nights and events like this as part of the Overseas Press Club. I think Abby Wright, who, who had to leave, mentioned that there is a Russia Hands Night coming up soon. Several of you in the room were at our- 24th of February. 24th of February, there is a, we uh, had a China Hands Night. So this is a wonderful, venerable organization that does a lot of good in the world. We also have the Overseas Press Club Foundation. Please get involved um, and you'll have a lot more fun evenings like this. Thank you.